Parshas Todos comes from Genesis, the 25th chapter, starting at verse 19. The topic of the lesson today is going to be the struggle of two nations. And we're going to, um, if we can, get through all the material that I've printed out and been sort of meditating on. And we'll, we're going to examine the whole concept of the struggle between the two nations. And the story that we have is the birth of Yaakov and Esau. Uh, the, the mother of these two young boys, first of all, it was difficult for her to give birth or to get pregnant. And Refka asked Hashem about her pregnancy. It even says, according to Midrash, that she went to to um, Shem. Shem, thank you, for, um, for some counsel and advice. And anybody that knows someone who has struggled with having a child, this is a very perplexing thing. And for someone who cannot have a child or bear a child, it's troubling and it's very difficult. And you always ask all of the hard questions. Why? Why, why can't this happen? And then when we see that she has a child, she realizes these two children are now just struggling within. I mean, she can feel them. They're like they're duking it out in the womb. And she isn't told that she has two nations within her womb. Two nations within her womb. It starts off in this chapter, and I would like to have Miss Lot read the starting with the 19th verse, if you wouldn't mind. And these are the offspring of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean, as a wife for himself. Isaac entreated Hashem opposite his wife because she was barren. Hashem allowed himself to be entreated by him, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children agitated within her, and she said, If so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of Hashem. And Hashem said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two regimes from your insides shall be separated. The might shall pass from one regime to the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her term to bear grew full, then behold, there were twins in her womb. <clears throat> the first one emerged red, entirely like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. After that, his brother emerged with his hand grasping onto the heel of Esau. So he called his name Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Okay, that's good right there. The struggle of two nations. The birth of Yaakov and Esau is, a, is, is quite um, um, normal at this point because we have the birth of Ishmael and Isaac, Esau. It's, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, that whole scenario produced two nations. You have the Ishmaelites, or we now have uh, what we would call uh, the Islamic people, right? That came from the, uh, the loins of Ishmael. And then you have um, now Yaakov and Esau. Esau comes out of the womb fiery red hair and covered with hair. Hairy kid. And uh, it's, you know, the, the, the term Esau means ready to go. It's like he came out of the womb as a grown man. You understand? He was fighting and ready to roll. And a, probably a pretty odd looking child. Uh, it says that y y when we read through Yaakov, we see that Yaakov um, is the polar opposite from Esau. Esau is the hunter. He grows up to be a very strong, he's, he's a man's man, right? He's the manly man. He goes out hunting and he likes ripping the flesh off of an animal and he's a fighter. Uh, very, very strong individual. And Esau, uh, I mean, Yaakov is the, the sort of quiet, humble uh, young man who studies in his father's house and in his grandfather's tent studies the concepts of universal Torah that was brought down by Shem from Noah. So you have Esau and Yaakov, polar opposites. And 
the first question that comes to mind is why would Hashem choose to have these polar opposites? Why the two? Why two nations? Why could he have not just had two kids that were just alike? I mean, my goodness, they were twins. Now, now what's the difference between paternal twins and paternal? fraternal? One shares a sack and one does not. Right, and so, and they can look alike or not look alike, right? Um, in that no, situation. The ones that share a sack will look alike, the ones that are good. Right, so, <laughs> right. So the first child, literally, the last child that comes out of the womb was actually the first child conceived. You follow? Who was that child? Who was that child? Jacob. Jacob. So that meant that the last one that came out was actually the first one that was conceived. That is why the covenant was to be to him. But the problem is, is the way the Middle Eastern tradition or the Eastern tradition was, the first one that came out of the womb was the one who was to receive the covenant of, of, of the father and to uh, have the great responsibilities of a great uh, righteous person within the home. Yeah, and later on, we're going to discover that Esau is not even interested. Is not even interested in that. Um, can you shut that door for me? Is not even interested in in the covenant. It is. It is sometime after he gets a little bit older that he trades his whole covenant responsibility for what a bowl of lentil soup. Right. Now, I mean, this is how much he thought about his father's covenant. Now, mind you, I don't think that he really thought he was going to lose anything. Right? He didn't think he was going to lose anything. And the reason why I believe he didn't think he was going to lose anything because, to be honest with you, the, the, the major part of the covenant that he didn't care about was something ethereal and spiritual and higher. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really, he wasn't interested. If it wasn't about the physical world, if it wasn't about, you know, meat and potatoes and, and hunting in the woods, it really wasn't important. And he was physically first Say again? He, he had thought he had it nailed, absolutely. Uh, and I'm still troubled, I'm going to be honest with you, and I don't have the answer, so we're not going to deal with it tonight, but I'm still troubled at a great tzaddik, Isaac. How in the world could he still favor Esau? Doesn't that surprise you? It's like having the two kids at the house, and one's, the, one's wearing his pants below his waist and showing his backside, no job, all he likes to do is ride around his pickup and hunt. I understand that, I understand that, but you've got the other boy who's the smart kid. He works hard, he studies hard. Right? That's the key, that's the key. But the question is why did Isaac favor Esau. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just, huh? Could have. That's a good point. He favored him because he maybe had some inf infinity toward him because he was kind of like a lot like him maybe. All those things are good. Nevertheless, y y Yaakov and Esau are the polar opposites. Why the polar opposites? Why the, such great disparity between the two? Well, this idea of the two nations struggling is something that we're very familiar with, and so we're just going to enumerate some of these ideas. We're going to talk about them briefly and how it affects us. In the news this week, we see the violent attack in the, in the synagogue there in Jerusalem, and these rabbis are killed, and Palestinians are celebrating by passing out candy in the street. Total, total, complete opposite views of the world, right? We've heard of the yin and the yang, right? It's, it's a concept, I think, in Buddhism, right? It's the balance of life, the positive, the negative. A battery wouldn't work without a positive and a negative. And so we see all of these things in life uh, as being... The whole universe is filled with this concept of you have to have opposites for balance to take place. Because if you don't have opposites, you never get balance. Now, what is the purpose? Now, when I look at what happened in the synagogue, 
it's not, ha it's not a very pleasing thing to see violence at this level. But, the, but we have to ask ourselves, what has been the purpose of the opposites? What has been the purpose of Esau being born? Why is there an Esau who later turns to uh, Adom, right? Um, um, the Edomites. Who are the Edomites? They end up becoming Germany and Rome and they become Eastern European. Hitler comes out of that. Why do we have to have a world that has both beautiful righteousness and holiness and peace and absolute dark evil? Well, we know for sure that this, the reason that the sages have pointed out is that whenever one is doing good, the other is weaker. Right? Whenever, and it's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, if you have a seesaw and you put a pretty hefty child on one side and you put a light child, what's going to happen? Now the seesaw is going to be opposite. It's going to be cattywampus. But in the world that we're living in, if, I, if, if we look around right now and we understand these concepts that come down from the sages that these polar opposites are, are, are for a wonderful purpose. What are the polar opposites for? It's the Yetzirah and Yetzatov. It's the evil inclination and the good inc inclination. It's the two that banter back and forth that produces the energy of spiritual life. It's the failures that help us to grow spiritually. It is the, the difficulties in our life that somehow propel us to ascend to higher levels. That is the purpose of the difficulties. When I think of someone who is an athlete, they tear their body down to build it up. Do they not? And they, they, they're actually, are, when they're doing power lifting and weight lifting, they're ripping muscle sinew and tissue. And when they're ripping this muscle, what happens? Muscle grows in its place. And more muscle grows so they become stronger. So what is the purpose of this counter opposite the Esau in our life? What is the purpose of it? To build us. To make us stronger. ISIS. Al-Qaeda, Palestine, all this violence, terrorism. What should that be telling us about the general condition of the world right now? We're what? We're very, sick. We're very sick. The whole world. That doesn't mean there's not righteousness and there, there are not righteous people in the world. But they're winning. Why are they winning? They're winning be simply because righteousness has not grown to the level to where it is makes them inert. Think about this. Jewish people have been living in, in Islamic communities for many, many centuries and never once was molested or, or, or been given a hard time. Only when it was time did Hashem somehow turn on, turn on the heat. Why does He do it? If you look, at, and Rabbi Mizraki got into a lot of trouble when he came into Houston uh, some months ago. I don't know if you guys remember this. And he was talking about how assimilation in Germany, that 60, 70 percent of the German Jews were completely assimilated. They were intermarried. They were not practicing Torah life. They were not living observant lives. And say again? In the 1930s. And, uh, and the result of that was the, the Holocaust. A lot of people were very angry at him about that. But if you go through Israel's history, you cannot, you cannot get away from the fact that every time Israel was in the lowest state spiritually because of the rejection of God's commandments and because of their rejection of their integrity and their relationship with Hashem, he always brought about either Esau or Ishmael to deal with them. Now why is that? I was talking to Rabbi David Katz a few months ago, and when he said this, it, 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 it kind of annoyed me because it's not something you want to hear, right? And he said this. He said, the reason why the Islamic world hates 
Israel and Zionism. And they'll say, we don't have anything against Jews per se, we just don't like Israelis or Zionists. Right? You've heard that. We don't have anything against Judaism, just against Zionists. And I'm not sure that you can actually separate the two, okay? But let's just say, let's give them, let's give them that, that they somehow have figured out a way to do that. But when you look at it, and this is, this is what uh, Rabbi Katz said, he says, you look at their baseless hatred toward the Jewish people. And if you know their history, you can understand what's going on in the spiritual realm. Now, I don't believe at a conscious level they are aware of this. Okay, they're, they're, they're not aware of this. But if you go on the Hamas website and you go and look at the history or the struggle of Hamas, they will talk about how God gave, or Allah gave uh, the Jewish people, uh, had a, Jew, a covenant with the Jewish people through their father, Avraham. That Avraham Avino gave, they, they were blessed with a covenant, but they failed to carry out the covenant. And therefore, the covenant was now given to Ishmael. But isn't that what Christians say? Christians say the same thing. Just right. Just, it's the same thing. And that, that, that sort of attitude toward Jewish uh, people, the Jewish people, brought about the, the pogroms. It brought about the Spanish Inquisition. It brought about the Holocaust. That same attitude has, a, there's a reason behind that. And it's this. Even though... The Islam and Edom, meaning Ishmael and Esau, even though the descendants are not cognitively aware of this, spiritually, it's deep down in their DNA. And, that, and, and this, they're responding to it. And this is what they're responding to. Since you have been given the covenant, you, the Jewish people, you've been given the covenant, and you're not going to live it, then the best that you should do in the world is just go away. Disappear. What good are you if you're not living according to the Torah? Hashem says this. A person who does tshuva, repents, lives. One who doesn't repent, dies. In the eyes of Hashem, a Jew that is not living according to the Torah is dead. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's why it says it rains on the just and the unjust. It, a lot of very good people died in the Holocaust. And it wasn't because God was punishing them. He was attempting to wake them up from this place that they were at. Many people became very religious after that, and then some people walked away from their Judaism and will never return. It's a, it's a sad fact. But with all that being said, what is the purpose behind it? And that is this, is if we, if we want to see the world changed and transformed, it's going to come not by tanks and battleships and aircraft carriers and politicians and united governmental fronts. It's going to come from righteous people sharing universal Torah to the nations. Now maybe the reason why that we're seeing such an uptick in this violence in the world is that deep down inside in the world of spiritual energy and connectivity that darkness realizes that it's getting ready to be vanquished. Because how in the world can we have such an uprise of people coming to Torah from the nations? At the same time, we see this whole dark side of Islam coming up to destroy and to declare destruction upon the nations. They are declaring destructions upon Europe and the United States. Why is that? For the very reason that righteousness is being exalted in the nation through, through a lot of people, I really do believe that we're living in an age in which we're, we're seeing the darkness wanting to, be, uh, to hold that back, to keep it back. And at some level, this 
good and bad should be assigned to us. Just like we know at night it's that the, when it becomes night, things change in the environment. When I was a police officer, I used to, uh, I used to uh, say that the nighttime was like going into a house infested with roaches. And if you turn on the light, roaches scatter all over the place. My mom and dad used to say, and your mom and dad probably said the same thing, nothing good ever happens after midnight. Right? Now, just the very sheer fact that darkness we know as the atmosphere changes. When it's light, things are different. In the world that we're living in right now, with all of the darkness and all the difficulties and with terrorism and with the threat of world domination through, uh, of, of, of radical Islam, what should that be telling us right now? Knowing this whole concept of Yaakov and Esau, knowing that the two nations battling each other, the battle between good and evil, what should that be telling us right now? Cling to Torah even more. Rabbi, say it again. Good will be victorious. I absolutely, would, I absolutely do believe that. Rabbi Greenbaum, uh, uh, call, we chatted just a few minutes after we heard the news about what happened. And he said, you know, he said, he said, my brother, we've got to work harder now than we ever have before. To not only be righteous, but to help others obtain that higher level of righteousness and connection to Torah. Now we can set back all we want and complain about what's not happening. But and I, I, I really honestly think that we'll get off focus and, and lose our prime directive. Our prime directive is not worrying about what our president's going to do, or what the president of France is going to do, or what ben Benjamin Netanyahu is going to do. We should be concerned with one thing being the utmost in our righteousness and holiness before Hashem and helping other people obtain that. That's it. That's, yeah, what am I going to do? You see, the problem is this, is in the world of the, the, uh, the two nations, we, each one of us have that inside of us, right? And it's very easy to listen to the voice of the Yetzirah. It's very easy to sort of let it speak to you because for some reason it's, it speaks the language of the human body, right? <laughs> and the Yetzirah always wants to take and distract you. The Ramchal does an amazing job when he talks about how to uh, obtain righteousness and vigilance in your walk with Hashem. He says that a person can become easily distracted by worldliness. Mm -hmm. Easily distracted by worldliness. And that distraction keeps him or her from actually obtaining the proper elements to grow spiritually and to, to rise to rise to higher levels of, of righteousness. If that be in the case, what our Yetzirah does is offer us plenty of stimulation in the world. Now, I know that everybody listening to this class and who are here uh, are not generally people who are that distracted. But I'm a human being, you're a human being, and we all have the capability because we have these two ideals, ideas struggling within us. How easy would it have been for me, and I can tell you, this is just a personal deal. When I came into the office after hearing the news, I was, I was annoyed, irritated, angry. And I tried to avoid the photographs, but somebody, you know, placed them up on Facebook. And when I saw the photographs, they were so... Uh, I can't even explain it. it graphic. Um, and it was just, it was vulgar. Uh, that's the only way I can say it. it was vulgar. And deep down inside, I wanted to be angry. But that is the Esau in me. The Esau in me wants to grab a weapon and go fight for the cause. But the Yaakov in me begin to cry and call to Hashem. Mm -hmm. Listen to Psalms, to him, prayers in Psalms and weep and sorrow for what happened. I understand the whole concept of elevation of soul and Rabbi, Rabbi uh, uh, Abraham Sutton has really uh, brought down some amazing Torah this last few days just in response to all of this.
think the first thing that we always ask ourselves when we see the conflict between good and evil is uh, something needs to be done. Something needs to happen. Our Yetzirah always says this. Somebody else needs to do it. But the Yetzir Tov deep inside of us, the righteous person deep inside of us, the, 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 the Yaakov inside of us says, no, I need to take responsibility for who I am and what I'm supposed to do. Yaakov didn't wait around to, to get his father's blessing. He did it. He took some encouragement from his mother, but he did it. When we are confronted with what we see in the world today, our response has got to be to bring down more righteousness and light in our own life. See, I can't, I can't change... I can't change our government. We can vote, but we can't change our Congress, our Senate. I can't change another government's attitude toward what they should be doing in the world. And yes, it seems frustrating the lack of serious response against the terrorist ISIS in, in uh, Syria and uh, uh, um, Iraq. But I realize the reason those things exist right now is to cause people like you and I to clarify and become a sentinel in darkness and uh, a, a, a people of deep clarity to make the crooked path straight by declaring that the only true answer for the world is the word of Hashem, the word of God. Rabbi Chaim Korfin said today, he says, I know, he says, if I could have a single message to all of the Islamic people in the world, especially the jihadists, he said, if you want something that's more valuable than 72 virgins, he says, come with me to the Temple Mount and help me build the temple. Because there, you will actually see God. He said, the problem with most of the radical Islamists, they're not doing this for the sake of heaven. They're doing this for the sake of their own ego, their own pride, their own anger, their own vengeance. But it's not for the sake of heaven. Good Muslim people who live their life according to the sake of heaven are being punished by this. And I hope that those who are Islamic that watch this class that I know watch the class who are struggling with what they should do and where they're at I hope they realize that they are just as responsible as we are to exalt righteousness and holiness in the world and 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 to not only connect to Hashem but to bring the creator of the universe into a in a position to where they can light up the world where he can light up the world Both of them have the same DNA. Both of them have the same mother and father. But one is of a world of ego and pride that leads to destruction. And one is of a world of humility before Hashem. That is the difference. And every one of us in this room, if we gave over to our Yetzirah, we would be like Esau, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't care about the covenant. We just wouldn't care about it. If we want to change the world, it's not by killing Esau. Yaakov never even attempted to go to battle. As a matter of fact, he tried to avoid battle with Esau. What did Esau, and later on we'll go through this next week in the class, what did Esau want Yaakov to do when they finally met up after 20 some odd years? Say again? Join me, right? Edom, which is Rome, which is Christianity and Western world, wants the Jewish people to assimilate. Don't be so odd. Don't stick out. Have your own little communities, your own little, assimilate, become part of us. And if you become part of us, everything will be peaceful. But what we find out is Hashem will not let that happen. Because when we find out that every time the Jewish people have attempted to assimilate and become like the nations, God brings swift and quick correction. 
Why? Because it says that he chastens whom he loves. My wife and I were talking just briefly today, and I said, the closer you get to Hashem in your, your walk and your, your responsibility of mitzvah and observance, the more he holds you accountable. And so he actually does things in the physical realm that you would have never had happen in your life because he expects higher things of you. Right? Just like you expect when you had a child and you had him at home, you had higher expectations of a child. That, and it's funny because you know how they have like some children, it's the good child that the mom or dad is usually the hardest on? Because they have higher expectations of them. Because when they do something bad, boy, they just they come down on them hard. What does Hashem do to His children? Whenever they're not focused, whenever they're not walking according to the principles of, of, of biblical ethics and the Torah, He brings about correction. I would hope that we can all, including those who will pass this class around to other people, be encouraged with this thing. And that is, just as we see the sunset, we know what the night will bring. We must all realize that the violence that we see has increased in Israel and in the Holy Land is a sign from our compassionate, loving Father, Creator of the universe, calling out with a voice of prophecy in the physical world for tshuva, for repentance. For the people of the nation of Israel to look up to Hashem and get their eyes off of the circumstances, get their eyes off the violence, get their eyes on Hashem and begin to live to the highest level of righteousness. In closing, the most beautiful thing that I saw were the next morning, early, that shul was full of young men and students davening and praying and studying Torah. That should be our response. As angry and as frustrated as, as, frustrated as this can be, we need to look at, at what Yaakov done, does. When he finds out, and we'll talk about this more next week, when he finds out Esau is going to come after him, what, is, what does he do? He escapes. Where does he head to? Huh? He goes to Laban's place. Sage says that he also took a tour to go visit Shem, the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. So what is Yaakov's response when he sees Esau heading for him and going to maybe possibly destroy him? It isn't to go collect weapons. It isn't to gather a great army. It's to run into the fortress of the word of Hashem and Torah and mitzvah. And this, my friend, this lesson tonight about the two nations should be this. As though there are two nations, we recognize good and bad. We understand the positive and negative. It always exists. Even within each one of us is the potential to be the lowest of lowest in our, in our morality, ethics, and all those things. But yet we've chosen to live at the highest level. And in the world that we live in, if we want to bring course correction, it's about promoting and, and feeding that which is positive. The animal you feed the most is the one that grows. All right? So we are going to be about, in this next few months and years, to help teach positive messages, to start doing positive mitzvahs, start doing tzedakah and giving to the poor, go the extra mile. If terrorists will go the extra mile to kill somebody, we need to go extra mile to bring life to someone. Bring life to their neshama. Bring life to their soul. Bring life to their mind. Don't speak destruction. Don't speak violently toward your family and your friends and your co-workers. But to speak life and speak hope, that is the secret to having Yaakov be the one who will come out as the great patriarch of the faith and survive. He could have easily been held captive by Laban. He could have easily been killed by Esau. And later on we see that Laban decides he's going to go after Yaakov and try to kill him. But it doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because righteousness always preserves the righteous. And I will say this, and I said it last class. I have, says uh, the psalmist David say, says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread.